was really the Fox River that brought people here the first time. And those were native peoples. They were here to fish and to use the transportation on the river to get around. It was also the river that brought the first settlers here, hunting furs and trading. And it was ultimately the river that brought our first industry here, mills that were running lumber and eventually paper. And it's that industry that propelled the first round of economic development and growth and prosperity in this region. They were able to make a lot of money because of the power provided by the river, because the river took their waste away for free. But we've realized now there was no free and the river paid the price. I think when we don't acknowledge the value of things, we take it for granted. And so talking to people about how much we spent to clean it up, about how easily that could be lost again, it's when you have assets, treasures like the Fox River, that once they're gone, there is no coming back. That is the value. watershed is an area of land that wherever raindrops hit in that area of land, the water follows into the closest river, creek, or stream. So a watershed kind of acts like a bowl, and wherever rain falls within the bowl, it's going to get to the bottom of the bowl. The bottom of the bowl for the Fox Wolf watershed is the Bay of Green Bay. So water that falls up in Crandon, Wisconsin, follows the river. Uh, the Wolf River down ultimately meets up with the Upper Fox River and goes into Lake Winnebago. The water from Lake Winnebago leaves, goes into the Lower Fox River, and then drains northeast to the Bay of Green Bay. And that whole region is the Fox Wolf watershed. When I walk this trail, I very rarely see people fishing it. And a lot of times in the spring, the water quality is not real good. I mean, it's turbid and it's brown and it's not real uh, conducive to want to be fishing out here. And that's why you don't see a lot of people fish. So there's definitely a big impact to society if we could improve these areas for people to recreate and fish. Some good positive things for people to do. Our watershed has had different issues in the past than we're facing now. PCBs are a chemical compound that was used in the paper manufacturing process. The release of PCBs uh, from about the 1950s into the 1970s injured a lot of our fish and wildlife species. PCBs cause things like cancer, neurological issues, malformations, tumors, other problems and that causes issues throughout the system and the ability for us to have clean healthy fish and wildlife here. We also have fish advisories throughout the Lower Fox River and Green Bay where the public uh, can't safely consume the fish or eat the fish that they catch and there's also waterfall advisories too due to the PCBs. PCBs bioaccumulate, they don't degrade. So when PCBs were released in wastewater into the Fox River, many of them or most of them sunk to the bottom of the river, they bind to particles, and then they move through the entire food chain. So a small bug or invertebrate might eat that sediment and ingest some of those PCBs, then other small fish might eat those bugs or invertebrates and on up the food chain, all the way to our large fish and our bald eagles. So it did impact the entire uh, system in the Lower Fox River and Green Bay. Many of those PCBs are being dredged or handled through the remedial process, but uh, we still will have PCBs in our system for many generations to come. Historically, uh, a lot has been done with point pollution. So that's like when there's a factory and there's a pipe coming out and sludge is coming out of the pipe. And you can easily say, this is where the pollution is coming from let's fix that problem. And then they treat the water, and, and although now the water coming out of the factories is cleaner than the water that's in the river. The Clean Water Act, which came in 1972, helped us with a lot of the pollution that we are seeing coming from industry, like the paper companies. PCBs have been banned, so it's no longer allowed to be used. 
the industry in the Fox River area, they have much more regulation on what chemicals they can use, how they have to treat or clean the water before it's returned back to the river. Now our problem is sediment, which is dirt, and phosphorus, which is a nutrient that grows in all living things. So it's hard to imagine those things as pollution, but that's the pollution that we're facing right now. And that comes from urban landscapes, from all of our yards, from the trees, but, and it also comes from the agricultural landscape. Anytime we plow up a field, that dirt has the risk of running off and going into our waterways. The sediment and the nutrients are causing dissolved oxygen issues for the fish that live in our waters. And the phosphorus is causing the algae blooms that happen in the river and in the bay and in Lake Winnebago. And then we still have what we call point source pollution, which is wastewater treatment facilities coming from the industrial and the municipal sector. So we really all have a contribution to the water problem. Runoff is when either agriculture or even the things that we put on our own lawn, so weed killer, fertilizer, things like that. When it rains, it just washes off into either creeks or even into our storm system, which in turn washes into our creeks. The Fox Valley area is quite populated um, and every year more and more people come to this area so as the population grows urbanization spreads more urbanization leads to more impermeable surfaces we have more roads we have more driveways more sidewalks the more impermeable surfaces we have it really takes away from water having the ability to soak into the ground that's one of our biggest impacts in the cities. As rainwater washes over our cities, it picks up a lot of things with it as it makes its way into our storm drains, which lead right out to our lakes and our rivers. So many people are surprised to hear that our storm drains and our streets lead to our lakes and rivers. A lot of people think that that water's treated before it's released into the Fox River. It's not though, so just understanding that that water running off is going to go untreated will let me know that there's things I need to do to keep that water cleaner before it's able to reach the Fox River and other bodies of water. The way that agricultural has developed over the years got into where it was more plowing was better. I think we're realizing now that we need healthy soil and the healthy soil in turn means less runoff, helps absorb nutrients. It's the fertilizers and the animal waste that are put on these fields and the sediments that are running off of those fields into the water that's causing the problem. I've been a dairy farmer since I graduated from high school in 92. Uh, grew up on the farm. Actually started taking some of the management roles uh, already when I was uh, 14, 15 years old. i uh, been with my dad as long as I could walk, probably, so and I was pretty much all, the only thing I have ever done in my life. One, one of the things that we work on here for water quality is soil health. Um, some of the practices that we do to improve soil health is cover crops, multi-species cover crops, no tilling low disturbance manure application. We're doing edge of field monitoring and other trials to help improve feed quality, uh, which in return, by growing a crop, we can also improve water quality. When we're, when we're doing trials out there and we can see differences in the field of different trials that we've done, and um, it helps us measure and find out you know, what, what practices worked, what practices didn't work so well, and also you know, the, the cost effects of what the practices that we did. The main thing we're trying to prevent is sediment runoff. If we can prevent that, we can reduce the amount of phosphorus that goes into the river by 50%. You know, we got the mindset of uh, a nice brown field after it's planted as a good looking field. I look at it now as soil washing away, other issues that, that come with that. When I see a green field, I see that as a lot less risk. It's a paradigm shift. It's changing the, the equipment dealers on the type of equipment that we have here to apply the manure, to plant the corn, and the seed dealers that can understand that, okay, this is what type of varieties of seed that we need. Also the agronomists on the way we soil sample. 
after that, if we can get that, that mindset changed on everybody and how they look at farming, it'll make it much easier. It's just trying to change that mindset is the biggest thing. drive up to the first leg, which is about as far as we can go. There's active dredging out right now, and then we'll get out and kind of look cool. at things. Cat Island was a historic chain of barrier islands in Lower Green Bay. Much of it was destroyed during the high water levels in the 1970s and early 80s, and especially the, the trees and other vegetation that was on the islands. We are restoring those islands so that the islands themselves will provide habitat for wildlife, but also improve the area behind and protect the area behind the islands for fish and other wildlife habitat that we want to work on in, in the Duck Creek Delta. I think over the last few decades, we've made tremendous strides in restoring habitat for fish and wildlife, both in the Lower Fox River and Green Bay. To date, there have been about $43 million in settlement funds that have been put out on the landscape to restore the environment. Those are things like places for the public to hike, land that's been preserved on the west shore of Green Bay, the Wolf River bottomlands, Door County, many other areas, uh, providing habitat for our fish and wildlife, restoring wetlands, improving streams, and giving uh, fish and wildlife a place that they can reproduce that gives them a healthy habitat to live and thrive in. I'm someone who believes government has a positive role to play, especially in areas where, you know, individuals can't do the advocacy or protection themselves, but it is always a balancing act. I think our industry is threatened by government and regulations. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, I'm trying to be on a per-farm basis on different practices, different terrain that each farm has, uh, different cropping practices that each farm has, should have a different set of rules for each one. The slope of the land, how fast water runs off, the type of soil that's there, all these things change what the best practice might be. And, and if you have a field that's very low in slope or flat, you're going to treat that field differently than one that has a lot of slope or where loose soil can run off pretty aggressively. And so we can't have a one-size-fits-all. We have to have kind of a policy that meets the needs of that local farm based on the soil and slope of the land that they're farming. If we can just regulate ourselves and being able to beat that before we have to have rules and regulations in place, um, we're going to do a much better job. We're much more efficient that way. Government often sees its role as sort of the enforcer, as kind of the bad guy, right? Because they can make you do things. Cleaning up the river did require some compulsion, right? Businesses had to be forced to pony up some funds to clean up what had happened for generations. Government played a role in that. But maintaining the cleanliness of the river, keeping the value of our natural resources, is going to require a partnership. These days, politics have become somewhat polarized, and sometimes I think people on all sides tend to adopt the entire agenda uh, from a purity basis. I think in a lot of cases, um, blanket environmental regulation may not work as effectively as some other approaches. I think many businesses and, and, and many farms want to do the right thing and uh, want to be responsible and want to do their part. I can understand some of the frustration. It's important that the state has a role not only in, in establishing the guidelines and enforcing the rules, but, but partnering with a lot of these farms in this case to develop nutrient management plans and to try to help them operate in an efficient way where they can do well economically while you know, mitigating any environmental concern. I certainly support some of the goals of what the EPA is trying to establish in terms of standards, but how we get there in the best way possible probably would require some more flexibility. And it takes regulation a lot of times to get people to do things, but you know, it can't be just regulation. We need to have everybody on board with wanting to do it and be part of the, the change. If we can all be good stewards of the land and water, we can do this together without increased regulation, but we need everybody on board.
Here at Thousand Islands, we do a lot of programming for the general public, for school groups. So we do a lot of guided hikes. We come down, we look at the flora and fauna that can be found around the river. And it never fails in one uh, group or another. We'll get to a point where you can see the factory across the river and they always make comments about, oh, that's bad, the factory's polluting and it's gonna kill off all the fish. And as an educator, I always like trying to get people to understand both sides of every story. So I usually ask, you know, do you know what that factory makes? And some people know it's, it's paper. Here in Kakana, we're well known um, for the paper mill here. And so a lot of times they know it's paper. And I, I ask them, you know, how do you use paper in your life? And they mention a couple of different, they draw on it, they get bills on it, they get homework on it. And then I say, well, if we didn't have this paper mill here, if we didn't have any paper mills, we wouldn't have the paper products to use. So I ask, how many kids would like to go without homework and tests? And they all raise their hand, yeah, we don't want any homework. And then I go, well, okay, that's great. How many of you want to go without toilet paper? And they go, oh. They think that's kind of gross, not having toilet paper, having to use cloth rags and washing them and things. And it's just a great talking point going, Yes, the mill doesn't look the greatest in our natural setting. Yes, they're using our resources, but do you know what they do with those resources when they're done? Are you aware of their cleaning efforts, of their sustainability efforts? And unless you're willing to live a life without anything that's created by industry, we have to learn how to live with it. One of the things that we champion here is the phrase sustainable balance. It's actually in our, our mission statement that we want to provide everyone with the knowledge and abilities and experience in order to help form a sustainable balance between the environment, between the community, and between the economy. I think as conservationists, we know that this is a working landscape and we need to balance the needs of our fish and wildlife species with industry, with agriculture, with urbanization, and all the other factors on the ground. You know, it can't always be about making the most money possible. We need the agricultural production, we need the manufacturing, but I mean, I think there are, there are ways it can be done where both industry and the environment can benefit. We chose this because this is the accessible part. We were doing the golf course, but that was a problem. People were golfing. So we came here and it, it worked out pretty good. I'm a volunteer. Uh, that's my son down in the water. They have certain sites that are flowing into the Fox River, and this is one of them. And they're trying to measure the nutrient content. It takes a spark. Um, you can't really just expect people to care about things. You have to get people involved. If people weren't getting out there and seeing and crawling through the mud, they wouldn't care as much just seeing it on the news or reading about it in the newspaper. There are so many organizations that care about the environment that are all around the Fox Valley, from fishing clubs and hunting clubs to friends of Thousand Islands, friends of High Cliff, and everybody needs your help. There's a lot of solutions out there. Many of the municipalities in Northeast Wisconsin already are under a stormwater permit called the MS4 permit. That permit requires our urban communities to reduce the amount of sediment, TSS, and phosphorus that are going into the water. They're doing that through stormwater management practices like street sweeping. I, I got asked the question, why does the city send the street sweeper around? And the reason the city sends the street sweeper around is because it collects all of the contaminants and things that are in the street that would otherwise wash into our watershed and it's part of their way of reducing their impact and meeting an EPA mandate to try to reduce pollution and contamination in our watershed. And the ponds that are going up all over in our communities, those are all urban stormwater best management practices. They're capturing the sediment and the phosphorus in those ponds before they enter our waters. 
It's important to empower people to uh, be aware and make decisions of their actions and what some of the risks are to pollution in, in, in our water because you get more people understanding it and we kind of change behavior and change habits, they'll understand it more. Government is never going to put someone and have them stand over every storm sewer and watch things run into the street and then go to the house and say, you changed your oil in your driveway and then it rained and ran off into the street and then went directly into the lake. But if the person understood that cleaning that up or not changing their oil in the driveway would protect against that from happening, you know, that's a way that education and awareness, I think, can empower people. But there's things that people can do right at home. Things like capturing the water off your rooftop with rain barrels and rain gardens. Having more pervious area in your yard so that water can soak in. The best thing that we could have happen for our river is to have more water soak in on site. They can be aware of the various types of fertilizers and, and uh, phosphates or nitrogen that they're putting on their own yards. They can be aware of when not to do it. They can collect grass clippings rather than just blowing them into the street where that washes down because in that grass is phosphorus. And so simple little conservation techniques that individual citizens can do on their own yards and in their own gardens can go a long way to helping reduce the phosphorus load that we're seeing, which then basically becomes a fertilizer in the water to create algae. As an individual, you can't really go out to a factory and stop pollution, but you can, you know, not litter or pick litter up when you see it. You can make sure that when you're moving your boat, you're cleaning off all of the weeds. You're not bringing zebra mussels from point A to point B. So there's a lot that we can do as individuals to help keep the river happy and healthy. Again, it's just have to change a mindset and a culture and the way things have been done. Maybe next time I'm going to do something like litter or put fertilizer on my lawn, I'll think like, oh, well, that could affect wildlife and, and do something a little bit differently. So there's practices from every sector that we can do to make a difference to our waters. We take clean water for granted because here in Wisconsin, we're surrounded by it. We touch multiple Great Lakes. We've got the biggest inland lake, Lake Winnebago. We've got rivers and streams and trails that hug these rivers. The Fox River has been and always will be a vital part of our community's health, our community's economy, and just their general way of life. When you're out boating on the river, you are enjoying the sacrifices and the work of previous generations. It's generations and generations who didn't overfish, who didn't dump their trash, who knew that preserving this asset was going to do more for you than it's going to do for them. That sense of selflessness and sacrifice is now your responsibility. This river has provided so much to us and it's our turn to give back to it and protect it to make sure that it's where we want it to be for our kids and our children's children. It's our job to be stewards of the land and water. In order to preserve this asset, you, you, you the individual, have to make a choice daily to act and advocate for long-term goals, for the value of our shared resources, and for each of us to act responsibly so that your children, your grandchildren, and the grandchildren you'll never even know will have this river to appreciate and to recreate. Because we only get one shot, and you are gonna decide whether that shot is successful or not.